right, so I'm going to bring a message tonight, and the message is called The Secret Life of a Christian. Did you know that a Christian should have a secret life? I know we're not supposed to have any secrets, right? But we are. Um, <laughs> Jesus talks about three things that he wants us to do secretly, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Three things between God and, and us only. He actually uses the word secret. They're not things that we have to do, by no means, but they are things that, that we should do. Things that Jesus says that there is a reward for when we do do them. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to have a little meat tonight. We didn't have dinner, but we're having meat. <laughs> okay? Meat's good, isn't it? All the guys love the meat. <laughs> meat. All right. So in Matthew chapter 6, we find Jesus um, really in the middle of his most famous sermon ever. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has already talked about the Beatitudes. He's, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. And then he goes on and he talks about how we should treat one another. He talks about how hatred is, is just the same as murder and lust is the same as adultery. And he talks about how we should love our neighbors and turning the other cheek, or sorry, loving our enemies, <laughs> a little different, and turning the other cheek. And, uh, and then in chapter 6, Jesus kind of takes a slightly different turn, and he begins to address a few things in society at the time, and he talks about what we should do in secret and what a follower of God would look like and what we would do in our secret lives. So today we're going to examine the question, how is your secret life? Jesus tackles three things in the Jewish culture that had kind of gotten a little bit distorted or um, maligned, even desecrated even. Three things that God wants us to do in our private lives. Three things in which the religious elite of the day had kind of used to puff themselves up and create what Jesus calls as earthly treasures. And if you want to read, we're going to start with uh, verse 1. And the first thing that a secret life of a Christian should have is giving to the needy. And Jesus says, verse 1, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness. So Jesus is talking about these things, these three things, and they are acts of righteousness. So be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So the secret life of a Christian first must include taking care of those around us. God commanded back in Deuteronomy chapter 24, he said, to take care of the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. And it was supposed to be an act that was sort of indiscreet, if you would. Um, the, God says, look, when you're plowing your field and you're gathering your sheaves, you know, just leave one or two behind. Why? For the stranger, for the orphan, and for the widow. He says, if you're, if you're gathering um, grapes from the vine, he says, just leave a few of those behind, right? Why? For those that are in need. But the Pharisees had kind of gotten to the point where they've really just maligned this, this gesture by gathering money in the treasury. Apparently, what would happen is that they would toss coins into these metal containers. And then, of course, you know what happens when you toss coin into a metal container. What does it do? It makes a sound, right? And it can make a loud sound if you're putting a lot of them in there, right? So what would happen is that they would go to the synagogue and they would toss their coins, you know, as many coins as they could or whatever they wanted. And people started to notice. They started to think, oh, hey, 
Stephen's pretty generous. Look, at, did you hear the sound of his coins as they were being tossed into the treasury, right? Yeah? So <laughs> that's what was happening, is they were kind of slapping themselves on the back. Wow, that was quite a sound we had going on there. Congratulations. You are quite a generous and good Jewish person because you are giving all of this money to the poor. And so <laughs> what they were doing is they were gathering what Jesus calls an earthly reward, not a heavenly reward. And Jesus calls them the H word. We all know what that is, right? Hypocrites. That's right. And because their hearts are not matching to their appearance. And we see that in today's society too. Come on, we have award dinners for this and that. And you know, we name pews after people and <laughs> all this kind of stuff that goes on, right? And you know what? You can do that if you want to. I will say this right here emphatically, you are not going to go to hell for that, okay? But I feel like Jesus is trying to teach us something here that is quite important. That there is a heavenly reward that we can have when we simply do this because we know that it's a reflection of the heart of our Father not a reflection of who we are or to get any recognition on our own. You see, our Father cares very much about those around us who are in need. I already read in Deuteronomy, but in James chapter 1, verse 27, you guys probably recognize this verse. It says, religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So if we're gonna do anything religiously, it should be giving to those in need. But we can't go around proclaiming the good that we've done. It's better to do it privately is what Jesus is saying. It's better to do it without earthly recognition. It's better to do it because we know it pleases our Father. It's better to do it because we know we are fulfilling the desires of His heart, not even to help others, yeah, we should have compassion, but it, I shouldn't give to this person simply because of their need. I should give to this person because they're needy and my Father loves them. You see the difference? We're not filling a need, we're filling our Father's desires. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Do you ever feel like your life is a Seinfeld episode? <laughs> Wow, that came out of left field, didn't it? That was a wake you all up, okay? <laughs> so sometimes I feel like my life is a Seinfeld episode. So uh, Jax and I walk in the morning, and Max sometimes too will walk, and we'll go to Panera Bread. You guys, uh, who's been to Panera Bread? Oh, good, everybody knows what it is. Okay, so you go to the Panera Bread, and, and um, right in front there, there's that little tip jar. You know what I'm talking about, like a little tip jar. And I, I like to tip generously. Not really because I like to have the recognition, just because, I don't know, I don't know what that person's going through. I feel like as a Christian, hey, I'm blessed and I'm just going to bless somebody else. So I'll go and order, you know, a bagel or coffee, whatever we're ordering, and then, you know, I pay in cash and she gives me my change. And just as I'm ready to put the money in the tip jar, she turns around and goes and gets me my cookie, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm not getting any earthly recognition. Come on. Let's be honest here. <laughs> I do want her to see that I care and that I'm tipping, right? So can we play that? Did you check to see if the sound works? I have this little clip, but let's just see. Hang on a second. You might have to start it over. Let's just pretend that's not rolling right now. <laughs> but I will give you the leading up into it. So George is buying calzones, and the first time he went to buy calzones, he put the money in the tip jar, and the guy didn't see it, and he felt like the guy was a little disgruntled with him when it was time to leave, because he was kind of like, oh, here's your calzones, you know, and he kind of felt like he wasn't getting any, any money, because the guy didn't see him put the money in the tip jar. So now he comes back again to buy calzones, and he is very earnestly wants him to see this tip.
So sometimes I feel like my life is a Seinfeld episode. Now, I did not go put my hand back in the jar. Well, mostly because you couldn't fit in there. <laughs> it's just like a little slot. Maybe that's why they do that. But, you know, what happens when we try to get earthly recognition, right? It just doesn't turn out too good, does it? And I think God does that on purpose sometimes, you know? He's like, you know, look, who, who are you giving for? You giving for me? Because I see everything, right? You see, there will be many on earth that'll do good. There'll be many on earth that'll do good. There'll be atheists that will do very good things. There'll be Buddhists that do very good things. There are many that don't believe in our God that will do good. But their good will never reach heaven. Their good will never have a heavenly reward. But when we do good for our God, Jesus says, there is a promise of a reward in heaven. There is a righteous act. That righteous act garners a heavenly reward. So when we give, it should be to please our Father only. And as hard as it is, we shouldn't be recognized, looking for recognition here on earth. And when you can, do it privately. Do it between you and God. The second thing Jesus talks about the secret life of a Christian, must include private prayer. And I'm going to read starting from uh, chapter, or verse 5, sorry. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to, see, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray... Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. So Jesus starts with, you know, when you're going to give, make sure, you know, it's, it's privately. It's between you and God. He says, when you pray, you should also do that in secret. And Jesus begins to describe what many of us would call our prayer closet. You know, it's that private time where we pray alone with God. And the Greek word, and I love this, the Greek word where he says, go into your room, that Greek word for room means store room which I think is really great (laughs) because it's cool to think of your prayer closet as a storeroom in heaven. It's a place where God and you or I store up our treasures in heaven, and that's what happens in our prayer closet. You see, the religious elite in Jesus' day, oh, they would pray loud in the synagogues. They would pray long, and they would pray loud, and they would pray wordy prayers, and they would try to outdo one another in their prayers. But Jesus is quick to point out the hypocritical nature of only praying in public and not praying privately with God. He says, look, you need to pray in your prayer closet. It's not that praying out loud is bad. I mean, we all do that, and Jesus did that, so we can't be bad, right? It's just that when we're praying out loud just for our looks and we're not praying privately, well, he calls it the H word. It's hypocritical. God knows what's in our hearts, and he knows our private life. And when we pray in front of others instead of privately, well, it's just not right. And our Heavenly Father knows us. The secret life of a Christian must include private prayer. And Jesus goes on to describe what praying should be like. And I love what he says. He says, do not go on babbling like the pagans do. Our Father knows what we need. And um, it might be helpful to kind of know 
how the pagans prayed. I, that's what I was like, okay, well, how do the pagans pray, right? So we'll figure this out. So this is how the pagans would pray. So the pagans had many gods for all different things. Like, you know, you want your hair to turn out good today? There is a god you can pray to for good hair, okay? <laughs> There's... <laughs> If something's bothering your eyes, there's a God you can pray to for that. If you want it to be sunny today, there's a God you can pray to that, for that. And so there was a God for every need, and every God had a different name. And every God had a different way in which you should approach them, a different prayer, you should say. Maybe a different way you should kneel or you should be standing. Every God had a different sacrifice that was supposed to be brought. You know, if you want the God of good hair, you're supposed to bring your curling iron, get down on your knees, and say to the God of good hair, Hair. Oh, God of good hair, whatever your name is, I can't remember. I would really like my hair to be good today. Good hair, God, please. And they would go on and on and on because they didn't know what the God's names were and they would get confused and they couldn't keep them all straight. So the pagans would pray to every God they could think of, in every manner they could think of, in any way that they could think of. And Jesus says, no. Don't babble like the pagans. Your God knows exactly what you need before you even ask. And they would think that there was this magic combination they had to hit. You know, it was like, um, you know, pulling the lever down on the slot machine. You know, they were trying to get all the magic combination together to get what they want. But that's not our God. We don't have to say things just right to get what we want. We don't have to say things in a certain manner or be a certain way to get what God has for us. That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> Our God is not like those fake gods. He is a real God. He knows what we need. Now, I want to make sure that you understand, yes, you can pray the same thing often, okay? It doesn't mean that if you have a need that is very dear on your heart, very heavy on your heart, that you cannot come to God and continually pray for it. There is scripture that says you should do that. In fact, um, you know, the scripture of the unjust judge or the one where the neighbor comes and knocks on the neighbor's door because he's in need and the neighbor is sleeping and he says, go away, and he doesn't stop knocking. But because of his persistence, he gets all that he needs. So there certainly is precedent for continually coming to God. It's just that we shouldn't think that this is the magic combination to get what we need, right? Right? Because there's a difference in our heart and how we come to God. It's like this. Heaven moves earth. Earth doesn't move heaven. Do you get that? Heaven moves earth. Earth doesn't move heaven. Doesn't matter how much we want. We don't move heaven. Now, we may be able to persuade heaven. I mean, we see that in Job. The Ninevites, God had decided that the Ninevites were going to um, be killed. He was going to wipe them out. But they repented, and they persuaded God to change his mind. They did not make him. It was on his own will and his own desire because he is a good God that he decides to do it. So we don't move heaven, though. Heaven moves earth. And then Jesus says an example prayer for us. And I wish I could go over every little detail in this prayer, but that is really like three sermons. So <laughs> I'm just going to go kind of briefly and hit some of these points because we could certainly go in depth, and, and I would encourage you to study it if you want to, But because Jesus does take the point to say, you know, when you pray, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let's make sure we know who it is. It's not like those pagans. We know who it is that we're praying to. We know where he is. We know that he is holy and that heaven is in charge of what happens in our lives. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're praying for his will in heaven to be done here on earth. His desires in heaven to come here on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. See, this is a hard one for me. <laughs> because, yes, God will give us our daily bread, but, you know, we're not supposed to worry about tomorrow. I can pay, pray like seven years in advance, <laughs> right? But God says, you know, give us this day our daily bread. We need to focus on today and this moment. We tend to get so far ahead in our lives that we forget this moment and this day. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Prayer should always include a forgiven and a forgiving heart. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We should always pray that God is guiding us in the right direction. And we know that he will deliver us. And again, Jesus says that we should forgive. I mean, he reiterates it, so I'm pretty sure it's important. He says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I think it's important that we spend a lot of time making sure that our heart is a forgiving heart so that we can be a forgiven heart. So the secret life of a Christian includes giving to the needy. It includes our prayer closet and our praying time. But there is a third and final thing that should be done in secret, and that is fasting. We find that in, in uh, verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Just like giving to the needy and praying, the Jewish culture has sort of distorted God's desires, and, and the practice of fasting is one of those. Fasting is kind of a bit rare these days. Um, it was done in the Jewish culture on a regular basis at this time. It was consider, You were considered superbly religious if you fasted, and so you wanted people to know that you were fasting. Um, if you were a really good Jew, you fasted, basically. But historically, biblical fasting was done as a powerful request from God. It was done in times that you needed to call on the forgiveness and the mercies of God, never for self-pride, anything but self-pride. But the Jewish culture in that time, they had distorted it so much that Jesus called them hypocrites. That's not what fasting is supposed to be for. Fasting is for self-denial, for personal spiritual enlightenment. And if you have a big decision to be made, I encourage you to fast. If you have a large struggle in your life, I encourage you to fast. If you have something big going on, choose your soul over your flesh. That is exactly what fasting is. But fasting should be between you and God, not you, God, and everyone else. It should not be a Facebook post, right? Well, it's supposed to be between you and God. Fasting shows, fasting is your soul's declaration to choose God over your flesh. Fasting shows God that you're serious, but when we do it with wrong motives, we don't receive a reward. You see, you can go on a juice fast and lose weight, and you probably will, but that's your reward. That's it. And I got good news for you, or bad news. It won't last. You'll probably gain the weight back. But when we fast to feed our soul, that reward will last. So how's your secret Christian life going? Do you have a secret Christian life? God knows our motives and he knows our hearts and he knows what we do in secret and what we do privately is important to God. It's not just how others see us or perceive us, but it is what's in our hearts. 
And Jesus says everything we do is either for earth or it's for heaven. It is either for God or it's for ourselves. It is either for good or it's for evil. There really are no shades of gray when it comes to the kingdom. It's either for light or it's for darkness. And these things will not go unnoticed. And when we do these things in private, we are building up rewards in heaven. Jesus points out that what we do in life is we store up treasures. Did you know that? We are storing treasures. We are either storing them here on earth or we are storing them in heaven. And he cautions us that we ought to be storing them in heaven. Simply put, heavenly things last and earthly things pass. In verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. And where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it challenges us on everything that we see. Is this a heavenly treasure? Is this an earthly treasure? What is a heavenly treasure? See, that's my next question I ask God. I go, so what's a heavenly treasure? And I'll tell you, um, I'm going to say something that's not very popular for pastors to say. I don't know. (laughs) I'll be honest with you, I really don't know. I mean, when I study to bring a message, God wants me to bring a message, and I'll study the scripture, and I'll find out everything I can about what a heavenly treasure is. I mean, I used to think that a heavenly treasure was an expansion on my mansion, okay? I used to think a heavenly treasure was a garden in the backyard or a pretty jewel in my crown, but, you know, I find that very dissatisfying as a Christian to think that that's what a heavenly treasure. Those aren't things I really care about here on earth. I don't know why I would care about them in heaven, You know what I mean? So (laughs) when I ask God, you know, what's a heavenly treasure? You see, the scripture's kind of silent on exactly what a heavenly treasure is. And so I went to the Greek and the Hebrew, and I learned out some some things there. And I also went to commentaries and those types of things. and, And I found that some of our best theological minds have very different opinions on what they think a heavenly treasure is. So... I'm not going to pretend that I know (laughs) what it is exactly. I don't. But let's talk about what we do know. Because Jesus is saying, I want you to do this because there's a heavenly reward and a heavenly treasure. And so if that's why we're supposed to do it, I think we need to understand as much as we can about it. So when I went to the Greek, I found out that the Greek word for reward is misthos. And what it means is it's payment for services or wages. So there's a wage for our righteous acts. There's a wage for sin, right? We all know what that is. So there's a wage for our righteous act as well. It has something to do with our life. And the Greek word for treasures, which I found very interesting, because the way that it's worded, it says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What it really means is treasure for yourself in heaven. Because treasure, the Greek word is thesauros, which means to deposit wealth. So, Jesus is saying that we are getting a reward for our righteous acts. This reward is payment and wages. And Jesus is saying, take that payment for your wages and deposit it in heaven. Starting to make a little more sense, right? So when we do something and we do it in secret or we do it with the right motives, our righteous acts make a deposit of wealth in heaven. So what I know is that Jesus says we should desire 
to put our treasures in heaven. We should desire to put our rewards in heaven. So I don't know what they are exactly, but that we should desire it, that it is good. And let me tell you something else. We know that heaven is a great place to put your wealth, right? It's not going to need a government bailout. It's secure. It's a good place. It is a place where our God will do good things from the reward of our righteous acts. So whatever it is that we are doing, God can take it in heaven and he can do good things with it. Does that make sense? So even though we don't know what it is, we know it's going to be used for good if we give it to him, if we deposit it in heaven. But if we don't deposit it in heaven, it is left here on earth where moth, rust, and the enemy comes in and steals and takes it. So if we have our wealth, something that's important, we want to put it in heaven. We don't leave it out you know, we don't unlock our doors, we don't leave our car unlocked, we don't, we don't throw $100 on the seat of our car and leave it unlocked, do we? <laughs> right? So Jesus is cautioning us to make sure that we deposit it in heaven. And how do we do that? We make sure that we do it with the right motives and we do it for our Father only, that our hearts are pure. And one way to make sure of that is to do some of these things in secret, to do it for him only, so the enemy doesn't come and steal it. So our challenge is to do these things, but to do them right, to store up our treasures in heaven, so we should give without expecting, right? That's what Jesus did. Come on, he said, he like healed people, and he said, now don't tell anybody, <laughs> right? Didn't he do that? He said, don't tell anybody. Just go live your life, be happy. Just, you know. I mean, he could have been like, yeah, now you go and you tell them that me, Jesus, the Messiah, I healed you. But he didn't do that. Pray in our storeroom. Jesus certainly did that, didn't he? We know he did that. We know in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had a prayer between him and his God. And can you imagine the treasures that came in heaven from that prayer in that storeroom? And fast for personal growth. That's first thing Jesus did. 40 days, I'm going to fast, right? First thing he did before anything else, he says, you know, I've got, he's got a big task on his, on his plate, doesn't he? He has a lot to do. So the first thing he does is he fasts. He denies himself physically so that he can build himself up spiritually with the Father. And these are the things that we should be doing. And I'm just going to pose a couple questions Jesus brought these things up because they were things that the Jewish culture had um, really distorted and used for themselves. And if Jesus were here today, do you think there are things that he would bring up to us that we might be a little bit hypocritical about? I think so. <laughs> I might not want to hear them, <laughs> but I think he might sit down here with us and he might say something along the lines of, you know, you're worshiping in your churches, but I don't see you worshiping me at home, <laughs> right? He might be like, you know, when you worship God, worship God, even privately worship God. He might say a little something about uh, how we do church. He might say something about you and your hour and a half ser or services. Because, <laughs> you know, the church in the early day, they had church all the time, right? They all came together. You know, I think he might sit there and say, you know, maybe you've kind of changed the way church is. You and your steeples. He might. I don't know. But I think it's worth us to think about making sure that we are not hypocritical 
in any nature and in any way. So if you would bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. I don't do this often, but I felt like I should, and I just want to be honorable to the Lord. And as we examine the question tonight, how is your secret Christian life? Not how you're living it in front of everybody else, not how everybody else might describe you, but the question is, how is your secret life with God? And I'm not going to um, look around, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to um, commit to the Lord to make your secret life a little better. You know, are you giving to the needy quietly? Are you praying personally and privately? And how about fasting? Are you remembering to do that when we have a request, when we need something from God, when we have something big going on, when we want God to know that he's more important than everything else? And if you want to commit to God to making your secret life a little bit better, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to raise mine, and I'm not looking around because it's a secret between you and God. And if you feel like I'm going to commit to making my secret life a little better, just go ahead and lift your hand because God knows. I don't need to know, and nobody else needs to know. It's between you and God. I know there's some areas in my secret Christian life that I definitely can make better. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You can go ahead. If you have your hand up, put it down, and we are going to um, head into communion. It's a great time to do that.